Um, so I'm going to introduce the panelists, and then I'm going to give some framing remarks to begin the conversation. Um, so first, I'll introduce Dr. Gina B. Kim. Uh, Gina Kim is an assistant professor of English and the study of women and gender at Smith College. She teaches and writes about critical disability studies, feminist and queer of color critique, and contemporary ethnic American literature. She is currently at work on a book manuscript titled Dreaming of Infrastructure, Crip of Color Imaginaries After the US Welfare State, which examines women and queer of color literary expression in the afterlife of the 1996 uh, US welfare reform. Her work has appeared or is forthcoming in Signs, Social Text, uh, MELUS, American Quarterly, Disability Studies Quarterly, the South Atlantic Quarterly, and the Asian American Literary Review. Uh, next I'll introduce Dr. Leon J. Hilton. Leon Hilton's an assistant professor of theater arts and performance studies here at Brown University, where he's an affiliate faculty with the gender and sexuality, uh, with gender and sexuality studies and science and technology studies programs. In addition, he's the co-convener of Brown's disability studies working group launched uh, in 2022 20, uh, this year. His academic research focuses on modern and contemporary theater and performance studies, with particular attention to the ways uh, these fields overlap with disability studies um, and neurodiversity, feminist and queer theory, and psychoanalysis. He received his PhD from the Department of Performance Studies at New York University. In 2022, he was one of 10 scholars to receive the Mellon Emerging Faculty Leaders Award from the Institute for Citizens and Scholars, recognizing junior faculty who are committed to the creation of an inclusive campus community for underrepresented students and scholars. Uh, finally, Dr. Sony Carañas Bolton is an assistant professor of Spanish and Latinx Latin American and Latin American studies at Amherst College. His research interests converge the fields of disability studies, critical ethnic studies, and queer theory in the analysis of Philippine renditions of. Um, I always mess up that word, in Asia and the diaspora. His forthcoming book, Crip Colony, um, I'm going to, <laughs> unfortunately going to mess it up, Metsi um, Jahe, U.S. Imperialism and the Queer Politics of Disability in the Philippines, argues that racial admixture in the Philippines was a racial and colonial ideology of ability enmeshing Spanish humanism and U.S. liberalism in the production and rehabilitation of Filipino natives. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm just going to um, give some framing remarks and sort of how we uh, envision this conversation um, in terms of what we've all uh, talked about um, in terms of the problems we want to explore today. Um, so we envision this conversation, given the broad prompt of disability, accessibility, and race, uh, as an opportunity to hear from three scholars at the cutting edge of disability studies, who are all actually working on uh, uh, who have book projects uh, at different stages um, here, who will be giving us a taste of those projects. Um, so I wanted to give some framing remarks on these terms, disability, accessibility, and race, that are deceptively simple. And also just provide some framing and context into disability studies in general, because we have a, a pretty interdisciplinary audience here, um, and the origins of the field and how the talks um, we will uh, have here complicate, complicate these terms and frames. So I want to start with a few definitional issues about access and actually how this term might be a distraction, or at least a term I think we will unsettle or even make access unsettling today. So disability studies emerged out of the disability rights movement, um, particularly in, in the Anglophone world in the US and, and, and Britain in particular. Um, one whose finest achievements in the US was the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990 an act designed to provide the right for individuals to have equal access to institutions and infrastructures. So much of disability studies is oriented around critiquing inaccessibility, despite these supposed wins in a liberal individual rights model. This is a good and necessary uh, critique of, of individual rights and, and, and liberalism um, through this push for kind of new horizons of accessibility, let's say. Nonetheless, I think the um, works we'll hear about today are innovative for going beyond access. In fact, and this is not a dig at our panelists, <laughs> the, access, uh, the access or accessibility doesn't actually appear in any of the talks we'll hear. So as a means of framing this conversation, I'm going to briefly bring in the work of filmmaker Jordan Lord, 
whose film After After Access takes up the term access head on by contrast, but only to turn it inside out. The documentary traces the multiplicity of meanings of access through documenting the filmmaker's own open heart surgery where the surgeons can access Lord's body, but Lord but was blocked from accessing uh, the institution by being denied uh, the rights to or, or permission to film there. Lord notes that the model of access as accommodation means that, quote, many assess the need for access in terms of liability. So a lawsuit is leveraged against uh, you know, many uh, art galleries, websites for not having uh, image descriptions for blind or low vision users, or university is sued for not, not having ramps. Access, as it is typically used, refers to entrance, the ability to enter existing institutions and infrastructures. Here, the infrastructure is held as a constant and the disabled subjects access needs knowable and manageable. Um, as Lord notes, though, there's a shift in, uh, in this model, there's a shift in perspective, but not necessarily in dynamic. The liability is smallest when the opening can be managed by including it within the institution's structure, Lloyd says. But such models, they say, simply anticipate and resist what access actually promises to do, expose an infrastructure to whatever is outside of it. Um, here, I guess I would encourage how um, to think about how access might return to its original etymological meaning as attack or onslaught that might reveal the outer limits of what structurally is, is willing to change or can change. The scholars we will hear from uh, in this sense note how disability might be such an attack and onslaught, and they amplify the lessons that disability has, I think, more broadly than an entrance into existing structures. They do so not only by pointing to the radical potential of disability to intervene in the world, but to complicate the monolithic notion of the disabled subject itself. In going beyond a rights-based model that holds the disabled subject and institutions constant and to inject an intersectional approach to disability studies, which is a very wide field, I think there's a, there's a temptation here to say that we're gonna do this by claiming subjects who don't understand themselves as disabled or who are not typically understood as disabled as disabled, to interpret them as such, even though that might not be how they're understood or identified. But I think that here, uh, the talks we'll hear are not about broadening our definitions um, of, of, uh, of like sort of who can be disabled. Um, I mean, people might say, for instance, that racism might be disabling, but here, I think we're not just trying to incorporate um, the ways that these structures are in fact disabling into sort of a more capacious identity politics, right? Um, I think it's actually not within that frame. Um, so going beyond traditional notions of both access and disability, they note how what, what Kim, who we'll hear from uh, first, terms a crip of color critique that might provide an opening to attack existing, existing racialized structures um, in, in, in going beyond access as accommodation and towards, towards a, an onslaught or, or opening that actually escapes the frames of um, identity itself, we might say. Um, so um, now I'm excited to hear from Gina Kim. Um, I'm going to uh, read an excerpt from a draft of the introduction to my book, um, which is titled Dreaming of Infrastructure, a Crip of Color Writing After the US Welfare State. And um, though this book is um, grounded in uh, close readings of literary texts, um, today I'm going to focus more on the big picture questions of um, argument, intervention, methodology, and framework. Okay. Um, so on the screen, we have a couple of epigraphs that open the book. Um, so I'll just get started now. Um, so when my best friend was diagnosed with stage four brain cancer in the summer of 2019, I found myself consumed by dreaming. More than any romantic partner, she was the person around whom I had anchored my life, the one who had first modeled for me the art of queer of color survival. With her diagnosis, I both dreamed of and mourned the future we would never share. My dreams also contended with the lived reality of her illness and with the structures coordinating her medical care, the waiting room, the rehabilitation hospital, the social worker, the insurance labyrinth siphoning her time and energy 
her accumulating medical debt. They contended with the troubling dynamic emerging between her and her primary caregiver, who was also her long-term romantic partner, who increasingly isolated her from other sources of care and support. And they contended with her repeated insistence that her cancer made her a burden to others. And because of this, she should be grateful for any crumb of support she received. I wanted so much more for her. In my grief, I found myself dreaming of other, more expansive arrangements of care that would render her less vulnerable to social isolation, debt, and abuse. I found myself dreaming of a healthcare system that does not harvest sickness for profit, does not treat sick and disabled people as burdens, and honors the inherent value of disabled lives. I found myself dreaming of care networks that would make nourishment and pleasure possible even in the midst of her illness. At the end of her life, I found myself dreaming of infrastructure. I know, however, that as a queer, disabled Korean American scholar, this dreaming is not allowed. At the very least, it is not expected. As disability justice writer activist, Leah Lakshmi Piepshna Samra Singha observes, Sick and disabled and neurodivergent folks aren't supposed to dream, especially if we are queer and black or brown. We're just supposed to be grateful that the normals let us live. But I am the product of some wild, disabled, black and brown, queer, revolutionary dreaming. And I am dedicated to dreaming more sick and disabled, queer, brown, femme dreams." End quote. Other writer activists in the disability justice movement, such as Shada Kafai and Talila T.L. Lewis, have similarly affirmed the centrality of dream work to projects of radical disability liberation. These writers situate disability politics within the long tradition of freedom dreaming, or what Robin Kelly has described as the imaginative imaginative practice of, quote, producing a vision that enables us to see beyond our immediate ordeals, end quote. This too is unexpected because disability is so often seen as antithetical to freedom. In the popular imagination, we are bound, bed bound, house bound, wheelchair bound. This image of boundedness also persists in the radical imagination of ethnic American studies and movements for racial justice, in which disability often operates as shorthand for weakness and political failure. Here, disability is very often equivalent to dependency and neediness, something to avoid in the pursuit of liberatory futures. And yet, while disability has so often been cast outside the scope of racial justice and liberation, uh, this book argues that feminist and queer of color American writers, such as Jasmine Ward, Karen Taya Mashita, Samuel Delaney, Octavia Butler, and Aurora Levins Morales, bring disability and dependency to the forefront of their literary freedom dreaming. In these texts, freedom does not take the shape of the unfettered or self-possessive individual, nor does it hinge on the achievement of independence. Rather, it emerges from the recuperation of dependency, the cultivation of radical interdependency, and the recognition of the numerous support systems upon which survival depends. Above all, this book highlights um, the dream work that disabled feminist and or queer of color writers have done to envision alternate infrastructural arrangements in a nation that has refused to support us. This refusal has assumed many forms and I focus in my book on the eviscerated US welfare state alongside other social assistance programs such as supplemental security income, um, also known as disability benefits and Medicaid. My anchoring event is the 1996 Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, a piece of legislation known as major welfare reform. More specifically, I examine the pathological narratives of public dependency upholding this regime of austerity. Over 20 years after Bill Clinton pledged to quote, end welfare as we know it, end quote, 
the mythical threat of state dependence continues to animate the national imagination. Organized around figures such as the welfare queen, the undocumented or non-citizen immigrant, and the disabled non-worker, this myth conjures up the specter of needy populations, implicitly racialized and disabled, draining the American public of its hard-earned resources. Not only has this narrative crucially shaped contemporary US public policy, but also, as I argue, the writing of women and queers of color who fought, theorized, and dreamed under the long shadow of Reagan. Dreaming of infrastructure demonstrates how contemporary ethnic American writers recuperate the maligned condition of dependency through their imaginative engagements with civic infrastructure, education, sanitation, transportation, and healthcare. By drawing readerly attention to these networks, such texts emphasize our contingency on human and material infrastructures alike. The pipe, pipes, wires, roads, and labor networks that coordinate contemporary life yet so often go unnoticed. They, just, they thus invite, in the words of performance scholar Shannon Jackson, a quote, acknowledgement of the interdependent systems of support that sustain human beings, end quote. Interdependency for scholars of feminist disability studies suggests a, a condition of shared dependence in which dependency can be understood in terms of its mutualistic and symbiotic properties. Rather than a parasitic relationship abused by certain types of people, here dependency describes a life-giving relationship and social bond vital to survival. Public infrastructure in my project's archive thus becomes a figure of condensation for articulating a counter discourse of dependency. One that documents the disabling violence of state neglect while foregrounding a public ethics of care. So by deriving a disability politics and aesthetics of interdependency from the supporting operations of literary infrastructures, this book develops a methodological framework that I term a crip of color critique. And Crip of Color Critique is a framework that um, brings together disability studies with um, feminist and queer of color critique. Um, in this way, it, it enables the exploration of a Crip affinity, as disability scholar Leslie Fry puts it, between disability politics and the targeted populations of welfare reform. Through Crip of Color Critique, I join scholars such as Leslie Fry, Liat Ben Moshe, Nirmala Aravelis and Jasper Poir, all of whom have explored disabilities, many entanglements with racialized and state-sanctioned violence. More specifically, I joined Leslie Fry in reading the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990, alongside the passage in 1996 of the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act. Rather than framing the state as a haven of protection for people with disabilities, as the ADA does, we pay attention to how the US state itself operates as an instrument of racialized disablement through group dif differentiated processes of resource deprivation and ableist rhetorics of public dependency that frame racialized low income and disabled populations as unrelenting drains on the state. But there's more. So in addition to analyzing the ableist reasoning at the heart of anti-welfare policy, a Crip of Color critique also considers how um, theories and narratives of disability um, authored by uh, women and queers of color can vitally intervene into state-sanctioned myths of resource parasitism. I envision this framework then as a kind of coalitional practice linking um, feminist disability analysis with black feminist and feminist of color thought, um, but also an epistemological or knowledge making project that highlights the alternate structures of support envisioned by women and queer writers of color in the face of infrastructural divestment. In so doing, my book centers the ruptural possibilities to borrow Rod Ferguson's coinage engendered by minority literary expression 
that enable and call forth other modes of knowing. Following this, um, each of my chapters considers how um, ethnic American literary engagements with infrastructure generate new perspectives on and passages around the punitive logics of public resource distribution. Refusing the social order reproduced by anti-welfare mythology, which weaponizes dependency to argue that some people deserve less than others, the texts I engage instead offer visions of survival that encompass the nation's least supported populations. Um, thank you, Emily and Gina, for wonderful comments. And also thank you to everyone at the CSREA um, for organizing this fantastic panel. It's great to be in dialogue with all of you. I just wanted to give a quick um, content warning that um, I'm going to read a poem at the very beginning of the presentation that contains a uh, mention of suicide. So I wanted to start with that. Um, uh, so this is, uh, the, the full text of the poem is, is on the screen and I'll read it. Um, the title is An Eight-Year-Old with Asperger's Contemplate Suicide, and the poet is Saray Jarrell Johnson. The blue whale at the museum's lonely, missing all her titan kin, face of plaster, veins of tin, she bellows her trauma in effigy. When I was a child on the lip of the woods, Preach, preachers lectured on Jonah's hubris, and I'd think, I don't need to know this. I just wanted to live in the sea. No good was religion. I'd set my inner vision on the brooks and the rivers that drained in the sea, a giver who held us imprisoned, but diluted their poisons. With conch shells and salt memory, in Plato and felt, I'd sculpt blue whale and narwhal, so deeply I felt I belonged to the sea. So Saradriel Johnson's poem opens on a familiar tableau, drawing us into the kind of scene that might be encountered on a school field trip. Torn from the sea and placed on display, an enormous carcass of a taxidermy blue whale, perhaps like the one that hangs in the Great Hall of the Natural History Museum in New York, becomes a container for the poet's solitary voice, which seems to at first to call out prophetically from inside its cavernous perpetually bellowing lungs, propelled to another childhood scene at the edge of a forest, and then across watery tributaries wending their way toward the ocean, the poem ends by leading us back to a scene that summons the kind of quiet absorption that comes from the effort needed to sculpt one's way out of a world and a life that are wholly inadequate to sustaining the forms of belonging and survival that it demands. Through a series of ecological identifications, first with the petrified whale and then with the sea itself, Johnson evokes the embrace of another watery mode of belonging that disassembles the concept of belonging itself. Suspended on the boundary between life and death, the poem evokes a state of contemplation that is at once held in abeyance and brimming with turbulent movement. A founding member of the Harriet Tubman Collective, a community of disabled poets of color, Johnson evokes precarious topographies of living and dying as they are modulated by the co coordinates of his identity, black, queer, trans, autistic. Yet only the poem's title suggests that one of its interpretive horizons might be a medically or psychiatrically diagnostic one. This interpretation is ultimately rendered insufficient and I think deactivated by the, by the poem's trajectories, lured by grim, exhilarating, unruly, deeply felt needs that exceed and even undo the constrictions and containments of the neurotypical world. The trajectories mapped out in Johnson's poem evoke the errant and unnoted, un, the errant and largely unnoticed ways of moving, acting, being, and doing that are traced um, in, in, my, in my book project that I'm uh, reading this from. Um, the trajectories, um, uh, the, the book um, seeks to describe hidden practices, silent countermeasures, and overlooked insurgent strategies that attempt to reconfigure the world so that it might cultivate rather than destroy the persistence and flourishing of autistic and other neurodivergent forms of life. Against the interminably shifting and unstable diagnostic taxonomies that classify order and regulate the distribution and modulation and life of, of life and death um, for subjects whose neurologies are pathologized, 
um, under a regime of what we, what we might call neuro ideology, my work in the book turns towards other territories of struggle, modes of survival, modes of survival, and configurations of belonging of the kind that Johnson's poem conjures. So neurodiversity is a concept that emerges um, in the mid-1990s, initially, initially from within the autistic activist and self-advocacy community that began to form during this period, representing the position that autism and other conditions classified as um, mental, neurological, or developmental disorders should in fact be understood as integral manifestations of human difference, rather than as pathological deviations from a set of norms that are in need of medical correction, intervention, or cure. As Jim Sinclair wrote in his 1993 manifesto, Don't Mourn for Us, often cited as an important forerunner to neurodiversity as such, quote, autism isn't something a person has or a shell that a person is trapped inside. Autism is a way of being. It is pervasive. It colors every experience, every sensation, perception, thought, emotion, encounter, every aspect of existence. Though the term neurodiversity is of relatively recent coinage, the concept and ideas behind it, I think must be understood within a longer historical, political, and theoretical perspective. I'm especially interested in how such assertions of autistic selfhood have taken place against the backdrop of what the philosopher Catherine Malibu has termed the era of neuronal ideology. Beginning in the post-World War II period, rapid advances and proliferating research programs in the mind sciences enabled the workings of the neuron, nerve, and synapse to be mapped at ever greater degrees of complexity and precision, occasioning um, uh, concurrent political, economic, and cultural transformations at the articulation of the psyche and the social. Any vision of the brain is necessarily political, as Malibu writes. There is today an exact correlation, she continues, between descriptions of brain functioning and the political understandings of commanding. The era of neuronal audiology has also been one of profound transformation in the meaning and lived reality of disability, yielding new diagnostic categories, techniques of intervention, protocols of surveillance and control, targeting those as identify, uh, as um, deviating from increasingly granulated norms of embodiment and cognition. Um, and what Malibu terms our contemporary neuronal audiology is also linked to the growing prominence of the spectrum as a concept and a way of positioning um, subjects along a, continu a continuum of difference. Disability, I think, reveals the various scales, temporalities, or an attention to disability, I think, can reveal the various scales, temporalities, and spatial imaginaries bound up with the ideas, with ideas about the neuronal. As the rate of autism diagnoses began to rise rapidly beginning in the 90s, both in the United States and abroad, and the condition has come increasingly to the forefront of public consciousness, it's often been figured in terms of a crisis and threat posed to the future of the nation itself. The autistic body becomes mapped as pathological according to the um, you know, sort of free-flowing circulating cultural anxieties about health, security, and productivity that are projected upon it. In other words, neurodiversity challenges us to revisit and rethink in a different light the very conditions of possibility um, for something like the speech act and the performative rhetoric of the body. So I'm not gonna turn to um, talk a little bit about how I see my project on neurodiversity as contributing to the topic of today's panel by talking about a very, very brief example from the larger project. So throughout the project, I'm interested in how um, an analysis of the role of disability in the structural persistence of um, racism and racist violence is especially urgent when it comes to questions of mental, cognitive, psychiatric, and intellectual disability and neurodivergence. Um, so there's obviously a long historical legacy that we could talk about um, from the um, yeah, history of psychoscientific racism, um, which continues to shape the metrics um, and forms of expertise through which cognitive disability um, has become knowable. Um, so here I'm going to talk about um, one, one image, and um, it's, a, it's actually a still image from a surveillance video footage. Um, and it's, um, the, uh, it's not a black and white image, but there's not a lot of color in the image. It's mostly um, saturated and pixelated image, and you can sort of see a vaguely blurred figure who appears to be running down um, a hallway which, um, uh, of, of, a, of a school building. 
So this image um, was released from uh, footage uh, obtained by the New York City Police Department, and it shows a 14-year-old African-American student, Avante Akendo, who's in the midst of running down the hallway of his school building in New York City. In uh, October of 2013, Akendo left the side entrance of the school, eluding his teachers and security guards. Um, and in fact, the, um, images from this um, security footage are the final recordings of him that exist. Akendo's disappearance prompted an extensive search effort, effort um, involving the police department and the wider New York community um, in the hopes that me, he may have fled into a nearby subway station, handmade posters with photographs of uh, Avante Akendo's face were plastered throughout the subway system. And here's an image um, from the, the subway, um, entrance to the subway. Um, over uh, several months in late 2013 and early 2014, um, newspapers, including the New York Times, extensively covered the search effort, um, and uh, the police department provided daily updates, and the city was really captivated by the case for several months. Sadly, on January 16th, 2014, a city search and rescue team discovered Akendo's remains in a forested area near a pier in the College Point section of Queens. Subsequent forensic investigations were unable to determine the precise cause of Akenda's death. Um, the city's medical examiner concluded that he had most likely fallen from an embankment into the East River. Identified by the school system and the police as, um, quote, severely autistic and nonverbal, um, this is a description that was repeated in media accounts of the case, uh, Akendo reportedly had a strong sensory affinity for trains, cars, and water systems. According to reporting about the case, he had long loved to run um, and uh, drawing on interviews from those who knew him, um, including his mother, Coker, the, the journalist reports that Avante chafed at confinement, seizing control any way he, he knew how and seeking out openings to forge out on his own. Um, despite the fact that his mother had repeatedly informed the school district of uh, Avante's propensity to er, and love of running, the security systems in place in the school special education program failed to prevent him from doing so. The, this case and, um, uh, prompted local officials and politicians to call for reviews of educational policies and school security protocols for students with disabilities. One day after his funeral, which was held at St. Paul's Cathedral, attracting an overflow crowd, New York Senator Chuck Schumer held a news conference to announce his intention to introduce federal legislation to be known as Avante's Law that would fund a program to provide, quote, voluntary electronic tracking devices to be worn by autistic students enrolled in public schools and to be administered by the U.S. Department of Justice. So the legislative proposals um, that take Avante Akendo's name, um, that, that use Avante Akendo's name, would thus seem to conform to a familiar set of procedures within, I don't know, I guess we're calling what we're calling late liberalism, in which the state's recognition of a vulnerable class or population becomes the occasion for reasserting, intensifying, and expanding the elaborate apparatuses of security, surveillance, and control that define contemporary liberal modes of governance. When such appeals are made on behalf of a group or population that is presumed to be less than fully capable of speaking for or representing its own interests, um, as has historically been the case, um, often in um, the, the, the kind of disability world, um, the authority of biomedical and psychiatric expertise attains both a diagnostic and regulative function. But in endorsing the view that the well being of individuals with developmental or communicational disabilities will be best served by the use of tracking technologies controlled by the police, Avante's law also reveals the extent to which the contemporary politics of neurodiversity and disability are inextricably bound to the formation of what we might call racialized surveillance and control, um, which I think is equivalent to um, just modern police power as such. Consider that the proposal bearing Avante Akendo's name was presented to the US Senate as an amendment to the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act of 1968, a piece of legislation passed by the Johnson administration that provided billions of dollars of funding to new criminal justice research and training initiatives with a focus on state and local police agencies. The Safe Streets Act was developed in the context of widespread fears that racial unrest would overtake America's urban centers in the late 60s. The act was formulated on the basis of a vision of crime, individual acts of violence as the central domestic problem in America, and called for a rollback of legal efforts to regulate the police in favor of direct fiscal aid for weapons, technology, and personnel. 
So while invoking the security and protection of autistic and other neurodivergent public school students, in other words, Avantai's law directly grows out of and expands the police, uh, you know, the institution of the police as a modern um, formation of power that has historically constellated itself in the US, at least and probably globally, around the surveillance of blackness and especially the black body in motion. Indeed, if, if the particular modes of, um, of surveillance, um, including G, uh, trans, uh, forensic GPS tracking devices, named in the text of Avante's law are characteristically associated with late liberal modes of security, the legislation also must be understood against a longer backdrop um, of kind of uh, histories of the visual schematization of the racialized body. Um, so I'm gonna um, actually move toward my conclusion and just think a little bit about um, uh, the, what you know? What what do we sort of see in this image, and what's at stake in thinking about the the movement that we can see? And I'm talking a lot about like the body and movement, and um, this whole kind of discourse about autistic wandering. So, um, a perceived diminishment in the capacity to control the movement of one's body in space um, is one of the most important justifications. Oh. Thanks, slowing down for the interpreters. <laughs> okay. Um, a perceived diminishment in the capacity to control the movement of one's own body in space is one of the most important justifications used to strip disabled subjects of their autonomy through surveillance, um, social control, and other restrictive disciplinary measures. Um, and the conversation and discourse that emerged around the Okendo case about um, autistic wandering, quote unquote, um, I think has to do with a sort of anxiety about unruly bodily movement that violates liberal conceptions of practical reason. Um, a faculty that um, Immanuel Kant defines according to the presumption of the will's independence of coercion through sensuous impulses. The sensuous impulses of autistic wandering pose a particular challenge to late liberalism's regimes of movement, which as political theorist Hagar Kotev argues, determine the means through which movement is produced as freedom or as threat. So I want to sort of think about, you know, how certain forms of movement get assigned uh, or understood as movements of freedom and some that are movements that signal threat. Rather than mapping or thinking about this image as a kind of um, pathologically loaded one, Perhaps such forms of movement and sensation might instead be considered according to Fred Moten's compelling account of what he calls the fugitive law of movement that makes black social life ungovernable because it is that which constantly escapes and exceeds any externally imposed social logic. This law of movement for Moten poses what he calls a paraontological disruption of the supposed connection between explanation and resistance. It should not come as a surprise that the official response to minoritarian fugitivity has been to call for more surveillance. Yet I think that wandering need not be the occasion for the further intensification of apparatuses of racialized uh, security. Can we conceive of a practice or a politics of neurodivergent and racialized embodiment that would move more errantly and fugitively away from such logics. Thank you. Um, today, I'd like to talk about the intersection of mestizaje, um, and I speak to you as uh, an American mestizo from the Philippines, um, and its intersection with disability, which foregrounds um, my forthcoming book, Crip Colony, Mestizaje, U.S. Imperialism and the Queer Politics of Disability in the Philippines. The argument of the book is rather simple. Mestizaje, which we can translate to racial mixture, racial admixture, um, or miscegenation, depending on your political vantage, um, is a racial colonial ideology of ability. And it represents an important case study to think through the intersections of colonialism and ableism, not only in the Philippines, but more broadly, particularly in sites that have been affected by both Spanish and US colonial power. I confront the historical and cultural representations of mestizaje and its constitutive implications with disability as a colonial logic that proposed the rehabilitation of the native Filipino into a fully fledged democratic subject, with the colonizer existing in a proper deed relationship to ability itself. Indeed, a sub argument of the book is that ability itself becomes a form of white property. Yeah. 
Um, we might even view colonialism or coloniality as a form of neurodivergence in a way I'm thinking with Leon's work. I suggest that the rehabilitation of the allegedly diminutive native of allegedly diminutive native capacity was seen to be an effect of colonialism, whose rationalizing and anchoring cultural logic was secured through mestizaje in the Philippines and the Americas. <laughs> I make this argument through the framework of what I call a crip colonial critique, which draws heavily on Gina V. Kim's concept of crip of color critique. Globally, I might say my framework is crip of color critique plus colonialism. <laughs> um, so it's interesting that we have this parallel formations. Um, what I'd like to share in the context of this panel today are my thoughts on the ways that feminist disability studies has taken up mestizaje as a key term in an effort to diversify disability particularly through the Kripkin figure of Gloria and Zaldua. In a passage off-cited by disability theorists claiming on Saldua as a disability figure, she famously writes in a way that explicates an ethos of mixture and mestizaje that, quote, the U.S.-Mexican border es una herida abierta, or an open wound, where the third world grates against the first and bleeds. And before a scab forms, it hemorrhages again, the lifeblood of two worlds merging to form a third country, a border culture. I imagine that this, uh, this is a very familiar quote to a lot of you. Moreover, she reflects on the tortilla curtain that euphemistically marks the position of the border as a quote, a 1,950 mile long open wound, dividing a pueblo, a culture, running down the length of my body, staking fence rods in my flesh, splits me, splits me, me raja, me raja. Because of the philosophical unfixity of the Chicana Mestiza body and its imbrication with and physical harm caused by a political environment emblematized by the border, it is unsurprising that many feminist disability theorists have been interested in arguing that Ansaldua is a foundational feminist disability theorist, even though she wouldn't claim that identity for herself. Such moves are demonstrative of disability literature that attempts to resituate some foundational feminist thinkers prominent in other fields as scholars or activists, not only in movements for racial justice, but also for disability justice, and also to question frameworks that would consider said movements as irrevocably separate. Yoon Jim Kim, Alison Kafer, Julia Avril Minnick, Anna Louise Keaton, Quoli Driscoll, Aurora Levins Morales, Leia Lakshmi Pepsna Samarasinha, Suzanne Bost and Carrie McMaster, sorry, interpreters, that's a lot of names, have encouraged engagement with Audre Lorde and Gloria Ann Saldua, for instance, as women of color feminist foundational to what Sammy Schalk and Gina B. Kim have called a feminist of color disability studies. Basically, I'm just channeling Gina Kim's work right through my paper here. Louise Keating, for instance, conducted interviews of Ann Saldua later in her life, which have crucially established the explicit linkages the Chicana feminists made between her physical impairments and her borderlands feminism. Dissonant with more, the more mainstream ways that Ansaldua is taken up in Latinx, queer, and feminist studies, McMaster has shared, quote, although I viewed Ansaldua as a feminist, a Chicana theorist, and one of the founders of queer theory, I had not learned to also think of her as a woman with a chronic illness, a person with a disability, end quote. Suzanne Bost goes as far as to state that Ansaldua's ample figurative use of animals to describe her mental states, such as la serpiente or the serpent, evokes a post-humanist break with the human-animal divide, tantamount to, quote, embracing madness, thus placing Ansaldua's worldview outside of contemporary critical or political discourse, yet also within contemporary disability discourse, end quote. In a similar vein, McMaster has argued that Ansaldua's very well-known concepts of, this is a quote from her, la facultad, nepantla, nepantleras, conocimiento, desconocimiento, el mundo surdo, new tribalism, and the quatli cui state, again, I'm very sorry, interpreter, con <laughs> contribute both ideological and pragmatic tools to our work of disability studies and activism. Again, that's a quote from McMaster. Scholars like Kafer and Yoon Jung Kim have argued that claiming figures like An Saldua as Krip Kin substantiates that there is no monolithic disabled person or universal experience of disability, but rather experiences, conceptualizations, and manifestations of disability vary widely by cultural, historical, and global context. Just as scholarship that fails to attend to disability is complicit in maintaining ableism, scholarship that attends only to disability, casting it as separate from processes of racialization or histories of colonialism, reproduces oppressive norms, 
Moreover, an additive approach fails to consider that disability will likely need to be reconceptualized when colonial relations are addressed. My stakes in these debates is to address such colonial discourses, as well as Schalk and Gina Kim's invitation for engagement with iterations of race and disability outside of the United States, which they themselves point to as a limitation of their own framing of feminist of color disability analysis. To wit, Suzanne Voss's US-centric engagement with disability may dangerously limit an understanding of the pitfalls of Ansaldua in adequately addressing both the coloniality of mestizaje which she romanticizes, as well as the settler coloniality of the United States, in which her claims to mestiza consciousness structurally obtain meaning. This limitation is evident in a provocative question posed by Boss speculating on Ansaldua's disabled subjectivity. Quote, what does it mean to live like an Aztec goddess in the late 20th century United States? End quote. Perhaps inspired by the framing given by techno-feminist Donna Haraway, characterizing women of color as political cyborgs, this pivotal question posed by Bost in her influential essay sugge or writing suggests that the rationality and spirituality of Ansaldua's shape-shifting mestiza consciousness generate critical opportunities for questioning liberal humanism as the locus of ableist ideologies. Boss contextualizes Ansaldua's ostensible indigenous deity status, elaborating that, quote, by bringing the ontologies of Aztec thought into her writings about her own embodiment, Ansaldua creates friction between temporalities and epistemologies. She undermines assumptions about human life and human history that are rarely questioned. We must use our imagination to answer this question because there's no historical or empirical model to draw on. By claiming that there are no models to draw on, perhaps contributes to and speaks to the prevalence of the eliminatory logics that erase indigenous peoples from the present. This has the effect of locking them in a past that Ansaldua and contemporary feminist disability scholars can then rehabilitate for different political ends, advancing disability justice whilst ignoring settler violence. Voss' exuberant desire to claim Ansaldua as an indigenous disability goddess speaks to the need for renewed calls for a rigorous transnational, comparative, and multilingual approach to what Josefina Saldana Portillo calls a truly American-American studies, meaning the hemispheric Americas. Differentiated from superficial approaches to the transnational that, quote, steer clear of the difficulties and complexities of archival research, ethnography, multilinguality, please learn other languages, <laughs> these scholars, and multiculturality required by this approach, and instead produces knowledge that is more tantamount to a kind of intellectual tourism. I'm going in kind of hard here, but I think it's important. Mm -hmm. The inability of Ansaldua to connect modern Chicana mestiza identity to contemporary concerns that affect Indians that live under the political category of Indian, rather than only ethnic genealogical claims to it, rarefacts them to an ornamented past that is treated as, quote, a kind of pastiche grab bag of Indian spiritual paraphernalia. And that's um, Saldana Portillo's really famous critique of Ansaldua. That is to say, Chicana Chicano invocations of mestizaje collude with the settler colonial project, positioning Indians in what Denise Ferreira da Silva calls the horizon of death. Even if such claims point to a process of mourning vis-a-vis -vis an indigeneity, the connectivity to which has been erased due to colonial violence. For this reason, it is important to keep in mind the ableist eugenic framework in which mestizaje was initially articulated. Boss claimed that Ansaldua, um, Ansaldua's feminist disability bona fides are anchored in her status as an Aztec goddess, advances disability justice as a form of settler violence. I contend that it is absolutely vital that disability studies not replicate these settler patterns of colonial violence that rely on an Indian that mestizaje has rehabilitated in order to advance the goal of having diverse disability studies. Without considering indigenous peoples amongst the living and the very real historical and empirical models that they indeed do bring to the present, disability studies will run the risk of succumbing to a multiculturalist logic that only very shallowly includes racial critique as a central aspect of its analytical operations. Might feminist disability studies be prosthetizing the image of a Crip Indian to be rehabilitated by and as a technology of colonial ableism? Disability theory that is not attentive to these realities actually then propounds disability as an effect of settler colonialism. Rather than a radical disability justice framework, what we are left with in this context is a settler colonial disability studies, 
One way in which borderlands feminism and Ansaldua's articulation capitulates to what Jessica Cowan calls settler ableism is by decontextualizing the deep eugenic quagmire in which mestizaje is embedded. Right? Ansaldua recuperates the cosmic race by ultimately under, misunderstanding Jose Vasconcelos's arguments around, quote, a fifth race embracing the four major races as a theory of inclusivity. Similarly, endorsing pseudoscientific arguments, romanticizing a hybrid progeny as a mutable, more malleable species with a rich gene pool. And this is a quote from Anseldua, indeed. Um, in a cel celebratory tenor, she extols the exciting hybrid character and epistemological possibility of the cosmic race. Quote, Jose Vasconcelos, Mexican philosopher, and straight up eugenicist, um, <laughs> envisaged una raza mestiza or a mixed race, una mezcla de razas afines, una raza de color, la primera raza síntesis del globo, the first mixed race of the world. He called it a cosmic race, la raza cosmica, a fifth race embracing the four major races of the world. From this racial, ideological, cultural, and biological cross-pollinization, an alien consciousness is presently in the making, a new mestiza consciousness, una con conciencia de mujer, or a woman's consciousness. It is a consciousness of the borderlands. Ansaldua actually seems to trumpet the ideal of Vasconcelos cosmic race, which one would be very hard pressed to do after a careful, careful reading of his essay. Given the ways that Ansaldua liberally reaches back into time to resuscitate a lost indigenous heritage, grounded predominantly in Aztec spirituality, it is fair to pose the question of what it means to recuperate the past decoupled from its granular specific historical conditions and contexts. In this case, the historical development of the race sciences and eugenics through which mestizaje by Ansaldua's own citational protocol obtains its meanings. The conversation that Ansaldua initiates with Vasconcelos in her canonical and significant contribution to women of color feminist thought and by proxy feminist disability studies forces us to come to terms with a contradiction at the heart of mestiza consciousness and feminist disability studies uh, as a concept that is born from the traumas of historical conclusion, uh, exclusion, pardon me, while also propounding foundational exclusions of indigenous and black people central to this cultural discourse of mestizaje. Questioning the ableism of mestizaje as a political discourse is in tension with the recuperation of it as a mode of productive, though arguably heavily romanticized hybrid thinking that similar to Vasconcelos attempts to recast the Chicano and Mexican uncomplicatedly within a, within a field of indigenous identification. Um, so that's it for my paper. <laughs> and I guess I want to um, end with a question in terms of uh, for my panel, but this panel, like what are some of the sites, um, methods or um, orientations of a transnational disability studies. Um, I'm really curious to kind of tap into that. Um, First, I'm just going to give a little bit of an opening prompt in terms of what I see as some commonalities in these, um, in these presentations, which dovetailed, I think, kind of nicely with my <laughs> opening remarks. So maybe we're circling back a little bit to, to those as well. Um, I think, um, I almost want to frame this in what one of the things that Leon said was about um, autism, or you were quoting someone, I, I can't remember who, but autism as a way of being. And I think all of these um, presentations or book projects go beyond the sort of identity politics of much of disability studies, which itself is Predicate, predicated in forms of whiteness or coloniality. Um, and, you know, Gina, you, you tie a lot of that together. You're sort of cut into this, your attack <laughs> into this is through the notion of dependency that holds together these things, not in terms of developing, again, a more capacious identity politics of disability, but actually excavating something, something deeper that it, it reveals. Um, even that seems like too pat of a way of putting it though. So um, I'm curious to hear y'all's thoughts. And then Sony, obviously your critique of this um, form of identity politics that has been long critiqued, um, historically critiqued, but really taking us back to the eugenics root of this, which makes, a, um, there's a big irony <laughs> and then claiming 
the the goddess, the disabled goddess, right? There's an irony in that if the whole ideology is predicated on eugenics, right? Um, so, and then also what it made me think about is Kyla Schuller's work on the sort of improvability of certain, um, the improvability of certain races over others putatively, right? Um, and which also I think ties back to both um, Gina's notion of dependency, like people who can't help themselves or something. Um, you know, the Reagan era, we were reading Kate, uh, Keith Whalo's book um, on, and that's Whalo, uh, W-A-I-L-O-O, um, on the Reagan era discourses on learned helplessness, right? So who can help themselves, who can manage themselves? And I think that again goes back to um, Leon's presentation about surveillance. So if y'all wanna respond, I would be pleased to hear your thoughts. I was very, very struck, Emily, by your opening remarks about, you know, really um, opening up for us what this concept of access means and what it does in relationship, you know, to, I think, to all of our work. Um, and I think in some ways I might like have it like maybe pose some of the projects that I think all of us are engaged in as sort of like access, but at what cost <laughs> a little bit. Um, and I think, you know, your point about, you know, the demand for access to existing institutions and infrastructures as being like clearly inadequate, right? And I often I think like, okay, if that's like the first phase of disability studies or just even the disability rights movement, the second phase is just like revealing all of the ways in which that stuff is like wholly inadequate and in some cases actually damaging, <laughs> um, which is, you know, I think it's a complicated, um, argument in some ways because you know you don't want to argue against access of course it, um maybe we i don't know maybe we do in some cases but um i think we have to think about um you know how is it that a lot of the kind of scholarly scholarly discussion in the field has been about that sort of at what cost question um and you know i really um, in, in, in the chapter of, uh, about Avante's law and Avante Akenda, I think it's this question of in whose name are, you know, these sort of um, expansions and um, of, of the police state, right, being, being made, right? Um, and, and are we really okay with how that's, how that's being formulated? Um, and in many cases, I think um, it's often oppositional to a kind of disability justice interdependency ethic that Gina was elaborating. Wait, can I say one thing really quick? Because I don't yeah. want people to think I'm problematic for suggesting yes. that we might be against access, but I was sort of nodding to John Lee Clark's yeah. essay against access, and that was another thing I was thinking about, so I just wanted to like make sure I mentioned that, about access is often about, I mean, actually, it literally is about disabled people being included in non-disabled worlds rather than the other way around. Exactly. And I feel like just to put that provocation out there about what y'all are doing in your own projects, right? No, I think that's a really important clarifying point. And I think underscores the fact that um, I think access often operates in parallel to the term inclusion, right? And the whole like DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion paradigm and again like kind of repeating this question of access to what like access and inclusion um it they're usually mobilized as a question of getting access to what already exists right rather than engaging in the kind of more radical or transformational project of asking like do we actually want these the infrastructures and the institutions that do exist. And um, Leon, in your paper, um, when you were talking about like the, the expansion of the surveillance state um, for um, autistic or neurodivergent youth that was sort of, um, that was brought into being through Avante's law. I mean, that is weirdly like, maybe not weirdly, but a kind of example of, in of access to a certain kind of like carceral infrastructure. Um, but then also, yeah, like understanding the, the kind of um, 
complications around this critique of access. Um, in one of my own chapters, they talk about like access to healthcare infrastructure and thinking about like Aurora Levins Morales and Leah Lakshmi Piepshna Samara Singha in their own like kind of disability justice life writing where they kind of grapple with the very complicated stance of um, disability access to things like Medicaid and benefits um, and healthcare, right? While also simultaneously wanting more and better, right? So this kind of like complicated relationship of understanding that some form of access to these kinds of life-sustaining infrastructure, state infrastructures is, is necessary in the current world that we live in, right? For disability survival, but also simultaneously saying that this still isn't enough, right? I'm thinking about disability as a lens rather than an identity, right? Is like something that we're all doing, but then also wrestling with the materiality of embodiment and pain. Um, and so I don't, I still, I feel like it's just, it just it exists on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. so. I think that the idea that we can anticipate, this was the Lord's, um, Jordan Lord's word here, that we can anticipate and manage access needs a priori, I think is something that is potentially a practical implication of things that I think about uh, in my work in terms of, you know, access as sort of a utopian project, which I, it just is like, you know, we, we can, <laughs> we can hate on it here, but it's, I think if we reframe it, first of all, as a lens, which I think goes back to something Sony said, but also just be open to what access needs are and mean. And I think that also does chip away at an accommodationist model. <laughs> you know, we have to change the idea that we can like anticipate and know what disabilities are, what access needs are, you know, I think that there is a practical implication there. We're just have an openness to, to what these things can mean. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you again to everyone who came and also to the CSRA. We're really happy that we were able to do this. Thanks guys. <laughs> <laughs>